evening and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. Um, in honor of the storm passing by, that's what the choir is going to sing tonight, uh, till the storm passes by. But I want you to turn in your songbook to number 376, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. And we'll sing that right after the choir begins this service. There's so many songs that have to do with storms and weather and things, but there's a whole lot of them, and we happen to have picked a few of them for tonight. Now let's stand and sing number 376, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Stand, please. <laughs>
be seated. Amen. As you're being seated, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Hey, I'm thankful we've got a shelter in the time of storm. Colton, if you would, would you come lead us in prayer this evening? Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can come before you tonight and just take some time to meditate on your word, to get our minds off the distractions of the week, and to really focus on you. I pray that we would be focused on glorifying you, on putting you first in all things, that we can praise you and love you more. Uh, give Pastor Wisdom as he teaches us on Joel tonight. Help us to grow in our understanding of the Bible and the wisdom that we can please you more. I pray us all in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Colton. It's good to be in church. Amen. And I'm thankful that we have a shelter in a time of storm. And uh, most of my household was asleep when, when we got the, alert, uh, the emergency alert about a bad storm. 80 mile an hour winds. I thought, my stars, 80 mile an hour winds. Well, we sat on the back porch. We didn't get 80 mile an hour winds. I'm not sure we got any wind, to be honest with you. But hey, there are storms in life. We may not have got one this evening, but there are storms in life. And I'm thankful we've got a shelter for those storms. Uh, thank you for being in church. Good to have visitors and guests with us this evening, this morning. What a great service this morning. As uh, the Lord taught us, even through his betrayal, Judas's betrayal of Christ, we can still learn even the great example of our Lord and Savior. Let me mention just a few announcements. Don't forget that there are invitations to Vacation Bible School on the back table. And even today, I got more uh, registration forms turned in for uh, ACT camp and Wilderness Christian camp. Wilderness Christian camp's full. Uh, so if you're a junior, uh, ACT camp's your option. And uh, if you're a teen, ACT camp's your option. And I would say if we get any registration forms beyond this week, that ACT camp will be full. Uh, so parents, grandparents, if you're interested in sending your child or grandchild, uh, again, Grace Baptist Church will pay. We're making an investment in these young people. Uh, we'll pay the registration fee. But if you're interested in sending them, we've got to get those registration forms mailed uh, to Maranatha Baptist Church uh, this week. <clears throat> So I'll be mailing out the, the ones I got today. I'll mail them out first thing tomorrow in order to be able to reserve those spots. Parents, grandparents, please see me. Even get them filled out tonight so that I can include them in the batch that we'll send out uh, tomorrow. <coughs> also, <coughs> don't forget about uh, July 3rd, the Praise Along the River community-wide church event uh, being held at the Riverfront Park. And I'm uh, thankful for the opportunity to preach that service and uh, that will be at the Riverfront Park there uh, in downtown Point Pleasant at 6 p.m. Again, I tried to emphasize this in the bulletin. We tried to emphasize this this morning, and I'll emphasize it again this evening. We are not canceling our service that night. We're still having church. Don't think, well, I get to stay home. We're not having church this evening. We do that sometimes. If we have a big meal, big afternoon meal, we'll have an afternoon service in lieu of an evening service. Well, we're not doing that. On July 3rd, instead, uh, we're going to move our service from here, from this location, uh, to the Riverfront Park. So you plan on bringing a lawn chair and uh, enjoying that time with us. I know that'll be a great time of fellowship. There's other announcements in your bulletin. Don't forget about these other important announcements. Uh, the Taze Valley Jubilee and other things that are coming up. Get a copy of the bulletin. There should be extra copies on the Connection Corner if you don't already have one. And make note of all these exciting things that are coming up. All right, today's New Testament Bible reading, remember, in the bulletin, uh, either in the inside of it or this week it was on the back, depending on where we can put it as far as space goes, uh, is a family Bible reading schedule. And today's New Testament Bible reading comes from John chapter 20. What a great chapter in God's Word. John chapter uh, number 20. I've got this chapter... Uh, uh, summarized in my Bible as a great renewal. John 20, there was a great renewal that took place on that, uh, on that first day of the week when they found the tomb opened and empty. So let's start with just a few questions. Remember, if you're part of our kids group, uh, kids, uh, that is uh, under 6th grade, 6th grade and under. If you're part of our kids group, you need to stand and raise your hand if you know the answer. And if you're part of our teen group and adult group, you just have to raise your hand. Teenagers and adults, we don't make you stand. Just raise your hand if you know the correct answer. Let's ask some questions out of John chapter 
number 20. We'll start with an easy one for our kids. Uh, the Bible says in our New Testament Bible reading this week that Mary Magdalene come to the tomb early on the first day of the week, and what did she find? What did she see? Kids? You had me fooled. I wasn't even sure where we were going. What did she see when she got to the tomb? There was no body there, right? Give her a round of applause. She didn't see nobody. <laughs> Amen. Come forward. Come forward. Get you a candy bar. You want to come get you a candy bar? Get you some sour gummies or some chocolate? Some type of sugar that you can stay awake all night. I'm going to have fun all night. <laughs> Excellent. All right, let's move to the adults. Let's move to the adults. Adults, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And uh, if you know the answer to one, uh, then raise your hand. And, uh, and I'll recognize you and you can give the answer. And uh, if you and just stay in your seat because I'm going to immediately ask another question, and we'll recognize someone and let you give the answer. All right, so I think there's three here if I can remember them. Let's start with the first one. Uh, who was the first person outside of Mary? Who was the first disciple to get to the tomb? <laughs> I saw it too. Miss Connie in the back row. All right, Miss Connie, who was who was the first person? It was not Peter. Somebody outran Peter. I'm going to go with the second hand I saw. That's Miss Judy. John was the first person to get to the tomb. Excellent. Give her a round of applause. Who was the first person in the tomb? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that man in the red shirt. Brother Steve? Red shirt, yes, sir. <laughs> he recognized him. He spotted him. It was Peter, the first person in the tomb. Give him a round of applause. And then here's the third question. I'm kind of proud of myself for remembering all three of these. Who was the last person at the tomb? Another red shirt. I'm telling you, there's something to it. Yes, ma'am. Who, Miss Mary Jo, who was the last person at the tomb? Mary, give her a round of applause. All three of you come forward. And uh, make your candy bar selections from our sugar buffet. All right, let's go back to our kids. That was three questions back to back to back for our adults. Let's go back to our kids. Kids, let me ask you this question. I want you to really think about the question. The Bible says that when Mary saw Jesus at first, she thought that he was the gardener. What caused Mary to know that it wasn't a gardener that she was talking to, that it was Jesus himself. Kids, not kids at heart. Avery, this is kind of a difficult question. Do you know it? Called her by name. That's right. Give her a round of applause. And I'm thankful he knows our name. There's a great song written. He knows my name. All right, adults, let's, let's dive back into your memory. I've preached a message. It's been a few years ago. <laughs> Why the chuckling? I preached a message on the three times in Scripture. There's only three times in Scripture that someone or a group of people suppose, that's the key word, suppose concerning Christ. One is right here. She supposing him to be the gardener. There's two more in scripture where they suppose concerning Christ. Can you tell me what they are? I can recycle messages, Miss Darlene. I'm going <laughs> to preach it again like you've never heard it. <laughs> Miss Darlene, I saw your hand. That's exactly right. When they saw, they were, they were rowing, and uh, they saw Jesus walking on the water, and the Bible says they, supposing him to be a spirit, cried out. So that's two we've got here in John 20. There, when Christ was walking on the water, there's one more. Miss Darlene, you going to make that long trek 
all the way down to get a candy bar. What do you want? One of these pension kids will bring it to you. That she wants a Reese's to take to Oklahoma with her. Joel's bringing it to you. He charges commission. <laughs> Half a cup. <laughs> All right, there's one more. Who knows it? Oh, Miss Ruth. Do you know it? She's confident. Miss Ruth? That's a really good answer. It's just not the right one. <laughs> Can I tell you what it is? You all are going to kick yourself because you know this. Uh, Jesus is 12 years old, and they, they're leaving Jerusalem, and they supposed him to be in the company. They traveled three days, and they finally started saying, where's Jesus? That sounds like what we do at our house. About three days, we start saying, where's Joel? You seen Joel anywhere? Where's Jordan? So they supposed him to be in the company. You knew that, didn't you? All right, Pastor Jeff will buy everybody a candy bar because you knew it. All right, let's ask one more question or a couple more questions to the kids, and we'll be done. Um, all right, kids, let me ask this question. Um, the Bible says that after they realized Jesus had arose, on the first day of the week, they go that evening into the upper room, and they're talking about the resurrection of Christ, but somebody doubted whether Christ was really risen from the grave. Who was it that doubted? <coughs> Yes, sir. Young man in the yellow shirt. Thomas was the doubter. That's right. Give him a round of applause. All right. Last question for our kids. Last question. What did, what did Christ say to Thomas to overcome his doubt? How did Jesus deal with Thomas's doubt? He told Thomas he could do something. What did he tell Thomas he could do to overcome his doubt? Touch his wounds. Give him a round of applause. That's right. Excellent. All right, next week's New Testament Bible reading. Grabbing, grabbing my bulletin real quick. Next week's New Testament Bible reading is in Acts chapter number 4. This is a power-packed week of Bible reading for, it, for all of it, but specifically for your New Testament uh, this is a power-packed week, wonderful uh, truths of God's Word as you finish the gospel according to John and enter into those great chapters of the continuing ministry of Jesus Christ found in the book of Acts. All right, Pastor Jeff, let's have our offering song, please, and uh, let's stand, let's sing unto the Lord. Pastor, you come lead us, please. Yes, number 26, great is thy faithfulness. Number 26, find that and let's stand together. And on the third verse, I'm going to ask our men's and boys singing group to come up here uh, and prepare for their song, There's Power in the Blood, number 362. But right now we're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Thank you. 
amen. You may be seated. Our men and boys group is going to sing 362, There's Power in the Blood. There's power in the blood. Amen. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Good job. Excellent. Good job, men. Good singing. As these men are finding their seats, grab your Bible, please. Open to the Old Testament book of Joel. Joel is considered a minor prophet, though not minor in content or message. Certainly not minor in his impact on God's people. The Old Testament book. Of Joel, just three chapters long, and we'll learn this evening <clears throat> that uh, Joel uh, is not even 73 uh, verses short. This book is certainly not the shortest book in all the Bible, but man, what great literary value, what great truth, and how God used this, this, uh, this man of God, this prophet of God, uh, to both uh, get the attention of the people in his day and to speak about truth not just happening in his day or in the immediate future but truth that would take place uh, until the end of this world and the beginning of eternity. Uh, Joel would uh, speak well into the hall, well into the corridor of time, well beyond his generation and many generations. Look with me please, Joel chapter number 2. And uh, we read uh, most of this chapter when we studied the book of Joel on Wednesday. And, and uh, what a great study that was. I so enjoyed the service uh, on Wednesday. <clears throat> Notice verse number 11. The Bible says, Joel chapter 2 and verse number 11. And the Lord shall utter His voice before His army. Remember, that army is referring to those locusts. And uh, the amazing power of the Holy Spirit using the prophet, the literary picture that Joel paints of these locusts and the devastation that these locusts will cause on the land. It's amazing when you read it. And when I, when I read uh, great literature, and may I remind you, the Bible's great literature. The Bible's great literature. And even, even the opponents of the Bible cannot argue that this book stands alone 
stands at the top of the literary pyramid. Uh, bestseller year after year after year. And even the opponents of the Bible cannot argue the amazing literary value. But when I read great authors who are able to take a pen and paint a picture, I told Miss Amy maybe earlier this week or late last week, I wish I could write like that. And uh, that's how the Lord uses Joel. But that army is referring to those locusts. Look at verse number 11 again. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, and he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord, notice that statement, is great and very terrible who can abide it. Notice the very next verse. So we've just, we've just heard of the devastation that God's judgment in this army will bring. But notice the very next verse. Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. There's an amazing transition that takes place. Joel is predicting judgment and chastisement and devastation and destruction. And then just almost at the flip of a switch, if you were, it completely changes if one thing will happen, if one thing will take place. That's found in Joel chapter number 2 and verse number 12. The Bible says, turn ye even to me. Boy, I continue to stand amazed at history unfolding before us. Uh, It seems like every... I try to be a positive preacher. Now, you know, I'm not trying to get a television show, but I'm not always doom and gloom. At least I try not to be. I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful and uh, I'm excited and I'm looking, for, uh, I'm looking for a ray of sunshine in the middle of the storm. I mean, I'm optimistic. I, I'm not doom and gloom. But I continue to stand amazed. I, I get in the pulpit and think it's bad. And then another week's news cycle, it's like, oh, it just got worse. And I think, now it's really bad. And then just one more week news cycle. It's, we didn't see that coming. Now it's really, really bad. Can I say even in 2022, just with the flip of a switch, as it were, everything could change if one thing would happen. Turn to Jesus. That's what the Lord is saying here in Joel chapter 2 and verse number 12. This devastation that this army of locusts will bring can all be avoided if you'll just simply turn to me. I say it as if it's easy, but really, the children of Israel, much like America, much like people in 2022, find it hard to turn from their wicked ways And to seek a Savior. But nonetheless, that would change everything. Can we look at the book of Joel this evening as we try to outline it? Let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we need you tonight. We certainly stand in the place where flesh would fail us and has failed us in the past. Father, tonight I ask for your help as I try to teach and preach your word. I pray you'd be with us as we try to learn this evening. I pray that you would help us to have open ears. That's where it will begin. Pray that you would help us to have an open mind. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to open our hearts. Lord, we realize that uh, if we attend every worship service this week, we'll have about four hours of Bible teaching and preaching. 
singing and fellowship. Four hours to last us the other 164 hours of the week. So, Father, we need every moment tonight. We need to be all in and completely invested. We need to listen and focus, Father. So I pray that you would help us to have open ears and an open mind and an open heart. I pray we would be sitting on the edge of our seat, the edge of our pew tonight, ready to listen, ready to learn something that we did not previously know, begging God to teach us and to grow our faith and our likeness of Jesus Christ. And Lord, certainly we realize that even Joel, the Old Testament prophet, the minor prophet, even Joel can teach us how to be like Jesus. Father, I pray that you would be with the congregation tonight and the needs that are represented here. Again, we ask you to be with those that would love to be here tonight but can't. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would touch those. Be with the preacher tonight, for his sins are many. And certainly, I do stand in need. God, I ask that you would move tonight and and speak to us, speak to me, speak through me. God, I ask for an outpouring of your sweet Holy Spirit on this place. God, I pray that you would work and stir. And at the conclusion of this service, Heavenly Father, we would have to bow our unworthy head and say that it's been a great place to be because we met with a saving God, a Jehovah God that loves us. Lord, we submit and commit this time to you. We ask it all in Jesus Christ's name and all God's people said. Amazing Old Testament book of Joel. We find some amazing things about it. Look with me at our outline, please. Nothing is known of the prophet Joel beyond the short introduction that we're given in uh, Joel chapter number 1. In Joel chapter 1 and verse number 1, the Bible says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And that's all we're told about Joel. In fact, as I studied uh, for this message, I found that there was uh, different Joels that were outlined through history as maybe this is the one. No, that's not the one. No, it could be this Joel. Uh, Joel is a short collection of poems uh, and quotes from uh, other books of the Bible include, I mentioned this on Wednesday, Malachi, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, Nahum, Isaiah, and Amos. So, Joel was well read. Joel understood Scripture. Uh, as a result, he would have understood uh, the, the pattern of the people's behavior. Uh, the children of Israel are not like, uh, are not unlike you in that their behavior can be patterned. And uh, as I've mentioned uh, in several other times, uh, the children of Israel would often, they would find themselves in a place of obedience and then they would find themselves in a place of disobedience. And it's almost like a roller coaster. We're up, we're close to God. We're living on top of the mountain. And then now we're, we're sliding back down. We're up, we're down, we're up, we're down. Hey, I know a lot of Christians that are like that. And I'm all in, preacher, give me a Sunday school class. And three weeks go by and you can't find them. You have to send the FBI to look for them. And I'm, you know, just hit a rough spot. Now I'm all in again, a rough spot, all in, rough spot, all in, rough spot. Hey, you don't have to live your life like that. The Holy Spirit can be the consistency above your feelings, above your emotions, above the uh, climate of the world, your situation, your circumstance. The Holy Spirit of God can be your consistency. Can I tell you, there's days that I wake up and I don't feel much like a pastor. Amen. And uh, there's days I go to bed and I don't feel much like a pastor. But can I say that the Holy Spirit of God is our compass. I can walk out on the back porch and I can say, you know what? I just, I don't feel like today, I don't feel like that's north. But guess what? The compass don't care about my feelings. The compass says, no, that's north. Maybe the next day I'll walk out and I'll say, you know, I don't feel like that's east. The compass says, I don't care about your feelings. That's east. 
And the Holy Spirit can be that consistency. It's in the book of Joel that we first learn about the outpouring of the Spirit of God on his people. We'll get there in just a moment. But Joel said God's going to pour himself out on his people. Let's look back at our study guide, the second, or the third line rather there. It's believed that Joel is one of the earliest prophetic writers who served in Judah during the early reign of King Joash. Now, if that's correct, and I have no reason to believe that it's not, if that's correct, Joel would have known the great Old Testament figures of Elijah and Elisha. That's a dynamic trio, isn't it? Elijah and Elisha and Joel possibly all living at the same time. Many notable characteristics. You'll find this interesting. Many notable characteristics cause the book of Joel to stand out from other prophetic writings, whether it be minor prophets or the major prophets. And we've already mentioned one. No date can affirmatively be prescribed to the authorship of this book. There's some debate about that. Uh, The prophetic messenger, Joel, warns of impending judgment but never brings a specific indictment for any specific sin. He never charges the children of Israel with any specific sin. And uh, uh, some of us in the room, we understand the indictment process. You can be charged with a crime. You can be charged with a serious crime, a felony crime. But just that charge doesn't stand alone. You can't just be sent to trial because of that charge. Instead, there's an indictment process where a a jury of your peers hears that case and says, yes, that case should move on to trial, or no, there's uh, there's not evidence that a crime was actually committed. Joel never accuses the children of Israel of a crime. Now, why is that? Oh, I know. Because there was no sin in the children of Israel's lives during this time. No, not true. You think about Joel and what we read in the lives of Elijah and Elisha. If he would have lived during those same times, then he would have been around that same apostasy that was taking place. Why doesn't Joel mention it? Could it be that because Joel was so well read and he had read the the writings of Malachi and Obadiah and Ezekiel and Zephaniah and Nahum and Isaiah and Amos, and he knew that the charges were already pointed out. I mentioned that on Wednesday. He didn't accuse them of a crime because their, their guiltiness had already been clearly identified. So instead of uh, pointing his accusatory finger, Joel just simply warns of the judgment the chastisement that would come. And then the third reason that this book is notable, looking back at our study guide, this book is widely revered for the literary value of the locust destruction. And again, I've mentioned that. It's in the book of Joel that we learn that Jehovah, our God, would pour out His Spirit on all flesh. And of course, it's Joel uh, that we read that in the book of Joel, specifically in the second chapter, that we read that, but it's not until the book of Acts that we see it taking place, that God sends the Holy Spirit. So you think the time that passed from God giving that that prophecy to Joel until it actually takes place in around uh, 40 A.D., if my mind serves me correctly. Uh, It's in the book of Joel that we first learn that... uh, Uh, I'm sorry, the next line, Joel's mission. Oh, I want you to hear this statement. I've offset it in quotes. I want to to give credit to where credit is due. Pastor Jeff, you might recognize this name. Dr. Thomas Lawrence taught at Piedmont. And uh, he made this statement. I thought it was so powerful. Joel's mission was to point out the sad spiritual conditions of the national spiritual life as the reason why the plague was sent, that plague of locusts. Not, we're, not talking about, uh, we're not talking about Exodus locusts. Those locusts were sent to the Egyptians. We're talking about God using locusts 
to get to the attention of the Israelites. So Joel's mission was to point out that the spiritual conditions, the sad spiritual conditions of the national spiritual life was the reason why the plague was sent and to exhort a national repentance as the essential step in returning to God. Hey, how do we deal with the locusts? i tell you what we do, Brother Dave. We go to Rural King and we get some of them sticky traps. Because I went to Rural King and got some of those sticky traps and I put them on top of our little brooder box where we've got our chicks. We have moved the chicks out of the house, by the way. Only took one time of me stepping in a chick landmine and they were out the next day. Uh, I know you guys have got to picture my house as like dirt floors and animals going everywhere. It's not that way, I promise. That's just the way I like to paint it out to me. So because we've already had a bad experience with the, uh, with the varmin getting in and killing our chicks, I went, <laughs> I went to Rural King and I got some of them sticky pads. I wanted some of them big, some of them wooden traps, you know, that would like break their neck. But I couldn't find them. So they, we've got kinder, gentler traps now where it just glues them to the pad. Like if a, if a varmint gets up there, a rat gets up there, it'll glue it to the pad. So we go to Rural King and we get some of them sticky traps and we put out and we catch all the locusts. And that'll fix it. No. Joel's mission was to, to tell the uh, the folks, God's people, to tell Judah, listen, a national revival is needed. Repentance is needed. And may I say that the key evidence of genuine revival is repentance. The key evidence, the singular evidence of a genuine revival is found in repentance. You say, preacher, there was, there was a stirring of emotion. They had revival. Wait a minute. Was there a stirring of repentance? Preacher, there was, there was an excitement that filled the air. They had revival. Wait a second. Did repentance fill the air? Because every time that we read of a real revival in the children of Israel's history or in the New Testament or as you look through the history books of real revival that lasted, had lasting results, uh, tangible results, the first key element that you'll find is repentance. And can I say on a personal level, as I have witnessed individuals seriously, genuinely get right with God, it's begun with repentance. Not a stirring of the emotion. Not a, a turning over of the leaf. Not a set of resolutions to do better. Before any of that takes place, genuine repentance for committed sin will take place. Dr. Thomas Lawrence said it was Joel's mission to point out that it was the sad spiritual conditions of the national spiritual life May I say that's true of America today? It is our sad spiritual condition that has led to the situation that we find ourselves in. I go back to my sticky traps for just a moment. The only thing I caught was a cat. It got out of the trap, but uh, most of its hair didn't. Look at your study guide, please. The importance of the phrase, the day of the Lord, cannot be understated when reading this book. Joel speaks of the day of the Lord in two different ways or in two different sense. Number one, he speaks of the former day of the Lord. And then secondly, he speaks of the future day of the Lord. And then the theme verse, really the theme verses, uh, for the book of Joel, the verses that we've read here, Joel chapter 2 and verse number 12, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye 
to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Notice the repentance. The repentance comes first and then revival comes second. And rend your heart, not your garments, and turn to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth Him of the evil. Now when that happens, when the repentance of the people takes place, then notice verse number 14, please. Who knoweth if he will return and repent? Now that's talking about God. God returning and repenting and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth in his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage uh, to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land. Notice the word then. After that repentance of all the people, from the, pe from, from the priest all the way down to the children, there needs to be a national repentance from the White House all the way to the church house. There needs to be a national repentance. Then, notice verse number 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will make uh, no, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army. I believe that's talking about those locusts again. And will drive him into a barren land and desolate, with his face towards. Uh, the East Sea, and his hinder part toward, uh, toward the uttermost sea, and his stink will come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. When? After they get right. When they repent and get right. When they repent and return, then the Lord will will do great things. Notice verse 22. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield her strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain in the first month. The floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent unto you. And ye shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Ye shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit, there it is, upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Notice what's uh, taken place here. God's made promises. And we see that uh, the promises that God made in Joel chapter number 2, they're really kind of repeated and reiterated in Joel chapter 3. Notice quickly, I'll be done. We see that God will rise against the invaders in Joel chapter 2. Look at verse number 20. But I will remove 
far off from you, the northern army. God promised Israel, if you'll repent, I'll remove those invaders. Hey, listen, can I tell you tonight that, and I know I, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying my best not to take this out of context, but it just too precisely describes America for me not to make a correlation. Can I tell you, there's all types of invaders in our country today. There's a, there's a show on the History Channel that I enjoy watching and Miss Amy enjoys watching. And uh, the kids have uh, enjoyed watching it with us. And I'm going to just speak real generally tonight because we're in mixed company. But uh, can I tell you, we, we watched it on playback on, I think it was Friday evening. We had missed when it originally aired live. So we decided that on Friday evening that we would, we would watch it on playback. And we watched the first, the first segment, and then they broke for commercial. And uh, commercials last, I don't know, maybe what, five, six minutes, seven minutes? Can I tell you, I was so embarrassed. Not about the show. The show's harmless. It's an, it's an outdoor show. Wilderness show. I was so embarrassed about the commercials. And I just about, because I knew I was going to reference it tonight in this message, in relation to the invaders that have came into our country and came into our state and come into your home, come into your lives. I just about went back and listed all of the words that caused me to be embarrassed. But there's stuff I wouldn't even say from behind this pulpit. Not on the show. On the commercials. God said, I'll remove those invaders from you if you'll repent. And then notice the second promise. God said, I'll restore again the land. I brought the army, but if you'll repent, I'll repair their damage. Look at verse number 19. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. I'll make you no more reproach among the heathen. What's bad even when the heathen were laughing at him. Look at verse 25. The Bible says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. So number one, God said, I'll rise against the invaders. Number two, I'll restore again the land. And then finally, I'll revive again through my presence. Look at verse number 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Notice these promises that take place when they repent. God will rise against the invaders. He'll restore again the land and he'll revive again through his presence. God promised that he would confront the, the evil. God promised again that he would uh, renew his creation. <clears throat> and then finally, God promised that he would fill his people. And again, can I remind you that it's in the New Testament we see that promise uh, being uh, being completed. It's in the New Testament that we see that promise being uh, fulfilled. I'll read this and then I'll dismiss. We'll close. In Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse number 10, the Bible says, By the which, by the which <clears throat> will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all, and every priest standeth daily ministering uh, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, 
after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins of forever, uh, forever sat down at the right hand of God. Hey, can I tell you, uh, Jesus Christ has made us priests. The individual priesthood. We believe in an individual priesthood of every believer because God's poured out His Spirit. And uh, God's made these promises only after they'll repent. I've given you just a brief outline of the book of Joel. Notice at the very bottom of the page, please. Very bottom of your outline. Total time to read the book of Joel, 12 minutes. 12 minutes. And yet it's still not the shortest book in all the Bible, the 16th. Shortest book in all the Bible. There's 15 books in God's Word that take less time to read than the book of Joel. Don't tell me you don't have time for the Bible. You could consume a lot of the Bible if you just take time to do it. 73 short verses, power-packed verses in the book of Joel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message tonight. Thank you for the study of this precious book. God, continue to teach us, continue to grow us.